Um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar, which I personally am so thrilled about. Um, my name is Katie Carriage Watts. I'm way over here. Here we go. <laughs> um, I work part time at On the Move, where I head our spearhead our efforts in terms of research um, and publications. Um, before I start, I would like to thank our partner for this event, which is HowlRound, who is helping us to live stream this webinar. Um, this webinar, um, my colleague Yuan is going to introduce our speakers today, but this webinar is a bit of a follow-up for On the Move on something that we did at the end of 2022, um, which is um, commissioned a podcast episode made by yours truly, <laughs> um, where I did an interview with a journalist um, named Hedy Judah, who has been working in the field of arts and culture for a long time and recently wrote a book um, about the issue of <clears throat> not specifically mobility, but about parenting um, in the arts. And so this is kind of a follow up for us to get people who are speaking from different perspectives on this issue of parenting and care work and how it relates specifically to the specificity that is on the move, which is, of course, um, cross border mobility. Um, just a few technical things before we get started. Um, Please make sure that you mute yourself and you turn off your video for the duration of the main portion of this webinar. Of course, if you'd like to ask a question feel at the end, feel free to unmute and turn on your video. Um, this is being recorded and live streamed. So just for your information. And again, if you don't wish to appear visually, keep your video screen off. That's totally fine. Um, we, have, we do have the possibility of having this event being captioned today. And so what you can do is in the bottom left of your Zoom screen, if you click on more, click on those three little dots, um, you should see a pop-up screen with the word captions on it. And if you click on it, you should be able to have captions. Um, yes, and at the end, if you would like to ask a question, we would just ask that you um, use the little reaction. Again, it's at the bottom and you can raise your hand. And I think that that's it. And it's now my absolute pleasure to hand this uh, this over to our moderator of today, who is my wonderful colleague, Joanne Flock. Joanne, yeah. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. Um, it is great to, to welcome so many uh, participants today for this conversation on parenting, care, and cultural mobility. So my name is Jan Flock. I'm the Director of Operations at On The Move. And for participants with visual impairment, I'm a white man uh, in my mid-40s. I'm wearing a beige uh, sweater, and I'm using a digital uh, white background with the logo of On The Move on it. And my pronouns are he, his. Um, as you may know already, On The Move is the international information network dedicated to artistic and cultural mobility. So we gather 66 members from 24 countries. And last year, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. We provide regular, up-to-date, free information on mobility opportunities and funding. And we advocate for the value of cross-border cultural mobility. We are funded or co-funded by the European Union through the Creative Europe program. And we deliver or try to deliver quite ambitious multi-annual program. So as part of these programs, we propose uh, twice a year mobility webinars to investigate mobility related themes. And today we propose to explore the tensions between cultural mobility, or international mobility and parental responsibility in the UN and internationally. Um, considering that um, transnational collaboration and mobility is an integral part of the trajectory of artists and cultural professionals, we want to discuss how our ecosystem considers and manages parenthood and particularly for women. Um, so why do we propose this conversation today? Uh, because at On The Move, uh, since we are a, a very interesting observatory point, we see these tensions um, that have been not growing, but at least in the spotlight uh, for many, many years now. And of course, parenting in the arts is something that is very old as a theme, but quite new in the level of awareness that we can, you know, uh, see, especially in these post-pandemic times we are navigating. Um, 
already a few years ago through a very interesting uh, European project called SHIFT, and the move worked on issues related to post Me Too movement addressing gender-based violence. And when unfolding these post Me Too uh, realities, many more broader challenges came to light, in particular the working condition of artists and cultural professionals, including parenting issues. Um, but we collected many testimonies throughout the, the years on uh, how you are a parent and a working parent where you have to travel internationally to venues and festivals, when you have to present work at BNRs or uh, apply for projects uh, for yourself as an individual artist, but for yourself as a family when you have uh, you know, partners and kids uh, to travel with. Um, collecting testimonies um, um, was made, were made quite informally. And uh, very recently, we came up with a critical mass of testimonies around the conditions of working artists and how uh, our ecosystem was not always well equipped to welcoming families. Um, and um, these um, testimonies um, were colliding where other concerns in, in our ecosystem. How do we move or be mobile uh, cross-border uh, with um, uh, environmental concerns and um, more sustainable practices. So slow mobility, green mobility, longer mobility experiences abroad. So how do you do that where, when you are a parent? Uh, quite recently, on we've decided to uh, monitor several accessibility aspects in all the open calls we signpost across the year, but also the funding sources and grants we collect and share through our uh, mobility funding guides. Um, this aspect of parenting in the arts is quite invisible still, and invisible in the sense that solutions are find, found by organizers, by festivals, by artist in residence programs, but these solutions or accompaniment measures are not publicized and they are rarely clearly described in open calls. Um, when uh, we commissioned to point of entry um, uh, and to Katie uh, a podcast on, um, on, on the topic, um, we were quite aware that this topic is quite discussed in several parts of the world, but we also realized that most of the literature available is coming from the UK and from Northern America, and many parts of the world don't have yet uh, put forward charters, guidelines, guidance, and testimonies online. So today we we are going to explore this with three wonderful arts professionals. Um, uh, we are going to explore the realities of, um, of uh, parenting in the arts um, with the idea that we not only talk about artists but also cultural professionals as we consider in our ecosystem who the producers, agents, tool managers, managing directors are also part of the conversation um, and we are choosing the word parents and not just mothers also as a you know as an, an acknowledgement that even if women are overwhelmingly uh, uh, responsible for, for child, care, child, child care, we also want to include, you know, other parents in this conversation. Um, today we're going to go through a conversation that will be around an hour and a half. Um, we want to have a conversation with, with the three panelists around what are the conditions for cultural stakeholders to um, avoid reducing their international experience and international exposure. We want to see what kind of solutions they could uh, encounter in their professional trajectory uh, uh, and through you know, grassroots initiatives to continue uh, international collaborations. And we would like to, at some point, collect recommendations, recommendations for the cultural field, 
recommendation for ourselves, recommendations for decision makers and policy makers. Um, so today, I know that the, the scope of the conversation could really go wild and crazy because parenting touch upon many issues, personal issues, professional issues, but because of the very nature of On The Move and our core mission, we will try as much as possible to address cross-border mobility, so the international projects, uh, this international dimension that we, we value. So today with me, we have three uh, panelists. Uh, we have uh, Casey Rain, who is uh, an actor, a film, television and theatre actor based in the UK, but she's also the co-founder and joint CEO of Parents and Carers in Performing Arts. So welcome, Casey, and very happy to, to have you here. Uh, we have with you Emeka Udemba, who is a Nigerian artist currently based between Lagos and Fribourg, so between G Nigeria and Germany. And uh, as a visual artist, he worked um, using many, many media, um, installations, video performances, photographs, drawing, paintings. But what also is interesting with uh, Emeka is that he leads uh, and founded um, a residency space in Lagos called Project Space Lagos, an independent space for contemporary art that has been existing for more than 10 years. Um, so we will be also discussing with him what are the conditions to welcome parents uh, um, in, in his space. And we will also have with us uh, Louise Michel Yu, who is a producer and tour booker working in the contemporary circus field. He's been um, 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 uh, working for supporting artists uh, companies developing their artistic projects, their performances, and to tour these performances uh, in Europe and uh, at global level. She's the co-founder of L'Avant Courrier, which is a very particular support organization for, for the circus artists uh, in France. Um, so welcome you three, and maybe uh, I will ask you when you take the floor to do a very brief presentation of yourself physically for our participants with visual impairment. I will probably ask a first question to, to you, Louise Michel. Um, when preparing this conversation, we had very valuable exchange around what are the conditions for artists to actually um, um, prepare the world or prepare the ecosystem in them being parents. And I would like to ask you, how far do you go into conversation with artists that are becoming parents or are about to become parents to prepare what could be a potential impact on their work life? Um, um, and in particularly you working in the circus field um, uh, to give us some examples of the conversation you have with your artist. You need to unmute yourself, maybe. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm Louise Michelieu. I'm a white woman uh, for around 40. Uh, I'm blonde with a white strand of hair and yellow pullover. <laughs> for you to know. Um, so uh, how, how we prepare the, the parents or uh, a person about to be parents uh, must, uh, must uh, first of all say that uh, it's been a great evolution. The La Vancourier, the, the organization I'm, I'm running with other four women, uh, we implemented it in uh, two year, uh, 10 years ago, sorry. And I can see the evolution through the times about those questions. From the very beginning, we've been working with uh, parents or people about to be parents. And I see that uh, uh, we, we, uh, hopefully we, we, are, <laughs> we are moving uh, forward. And uh, so the, how, how we prepare that, uh, I see that from the, at the beginning of the bureau, we, we did not talk so much about it. It was more about between the artists, they were talking about it and taking this in charge by themselves. Uh, 
and and now we are trying to to create this conversation because the very first step for us is the discussions inside the teams from the experiences we had it was um, uh, very difficult in some teams like kind of trauma for uh, for parents that they are not uh, heard about that that it um, the only answer was uh, okay it's a it's a private matter and you should deal with this and this is the very first step which is quite difficult and something more in circus like uh, more particular to circus is the question of physical and also of physical um, uh, like condition and also of partners like uh, of course in some other arts you also have partners <laughs> but in some uh, in some circus disciplines uh, you are partners and you cannot work with another partner like uh, after two weeks you need like real um, uh, great time of rehearsal and knowing each other etc so this is uh, this is really particular to circus and we are trying to now to raise the conversation about this uh, and from the tensions we had inside the the, the teams was also that uh, all the people needed to be taken into consideration, not only parents, <laughs> obviously. So this was our very first step. And uh, recently in uh, in France, uh, Biennale in Marseille, there were there was a discussion about this um, these topics, and the the discussion went on the physical recovery for people. And I, I talk about it because um, the artists who were talking about that, um, uh, especially from Compagnie Basinga, if you want to learn a bit more, uh, they were uh, saying that um, it is important also to prepare uh, during the pregnancy for circus artists in particular. So the, we hope that the National uh, Circus School in France will um, will prepare this for the next year to have two sessions during their year to, to, to work physically with uh, people who are pregnant and after they gave birth to, to be back on stage. So it's some few few things I can I can tell from the very beginning. But that's interesting because uh, what you are pointing out in a way is that the in these cases the uh, ideal balance be between private life and work life explode i mean there's no um, you know a border anymore in the sense that um when a collective of artists or an artistic company works together create performances together uh, when one is having a baby, actually the entire company or the entire collective is having a baby because everybody needs to adjust to the the very reality of the impact that um, it will have on the trajectory of a, a collective artistic uh, trajectory. And the first is, and, and the second uh, uh, thing that is interesting is the idea that you, um, you mention examples in France that are quite interesting in the circus field. And I'm sure we could find similar experiences in the dance field that um, artists have recovery plans for uh, rebuilding their, their body or being sh fit again to perform um, um, and use their craft again and try to recover from sometimes difficult pregnancies. Um, so it's interesting that an art school is involved in this process of supporting mothers uh, and welcoming them back to school to actually practice and make sure they can um, go back on track with their artistic and creative practice. Um, I'm going to ask now a question to Emeka. Uh, Emeka, I don't, uh, we don't see you. Maybe you can put your, your video on. Um, uh, welcome, uh, Emeka. Uh, the same before taking the floor, I will ask you to describe briefly for, for our participants with, with visual impairments. Um, Emeka, you are an artist that is 
navigating several countries, not only because you uh, leave between two continents, between uh, uh, um, uh, Germany and uh, Nigeria, but also because of your art artistic practice, you have a lot of um, uh, projects that takes place in different parts of the world. Um, you are invited in uh, biennials, uh, you are uh, uh, putting exhibitions on, etc. And I was wondering um, that if the, the, the very fact of being an, a father impacted your, um, your international projects and how if they did. Yeah, thank you, first of all, so much for this uh, very important forum. As you said, um, first, I want to introduce myself again. I'm Emeka Udemba. I'm an artist, and I'm also the facilitator of um, Project Space Lagos in Nigeria. So Project Space is a space that like uh, offer interdisciplinary um, possibilities for artists, and we also offer residency um, possibilities. Yes, as an artist, as a you know, an active one at that, I think there's a um, a conception that being a parent or being an artist and being a parent is is, is something that you can either choose one or the other. But I find um, in today's world, I think we should be able to kind of combine things together and and make them work. And the fact that most, most of the time, if you're talking about parenting, most of us, we also think it's just the women that are doing the parenting. But I think we should also start including men because for me, I also um, had to you know, manage the situation of being one part of the parent, being an artist, and dealing with that situation of going to residences also with my kid. And um, I find, you know, instead of being like a, um, almost like a negative being a parent, I find it's actually enriching. You know, if both partners, if the artist and the, say, um, facilitators, like they say, the residency spaces have a common goal because it has to, the common goal would be to enhance the, um, or give the artist the opportunity to almost improve or explore further his practice. And if this is the main goal for the two um, entities that are into this process, I think for me, my experience is that both ways or both, both uh, partners will have to be very flexible in the way they um, uh, kind of construct this relationship. You know, if they are flexible, there are ways to go around difficulties. Definitely it's challenging to be a parent and an artist. You know, the first residency that I did with my kid is when my daughter was six years, six months, six months old. And I found it in, in the beginning, it was scary to travel with a six month old kid. But at the end of the day, it was one of the most interesting aspects because a six, a six month old kid just eats and sleep. So, you know, just feed the kid, put her in, uh, you know, put her in bed. She can't run away, she can't move. She just like sleeps. So you have all the, all the time in the world to, to be creative. You just need to, you know, peep in once in a while and see that she's fine and you are good to go. And then the second time I had also, you know, experiencing when my kid was also maybe nine or 10, it was also easy because you, I had to kind of try to in, incorporate her into my work, make her part of my work, and then find time to go to these residencies when she has long time breaks. So if the partner is willing to be accommodating, you know, the times that you can go for a month or two would be no problem because most schools, most um, schools have long, when they have long breaks, it's either a month or two. So you can use those breaks and do those residencies with your kid. And, you know, uh, um, um, those moments are really even intensive periods where you actually have your kid to yourself and you're doing your work. So 
instead of being a minus, I see it really as very enriching to the whole overall creative process. Yeah, that is very interesting also that you um, you share your, your experience and what I, I see also in, in what you share is that you point out the fact that it takes a conversation. I mean, in a way, it's, it, it's tailor-made. Um, uh, and the gatekeepers or the facilitators, the host of residencies, but I'm sure this could apply to festivals and, and other um, um, uh, artistic events that welcome artists for work, for creation, for presentation, um, need to be flexible. So to listen, actually, which I find it very interesting that um, uh, we are already in this, um, you know, uh, uh, recommendation mode. Uh, let's listen to uh, the parents. Let's work with them on what is the solution that fits best according to the age, obviously, of the, the kids or the children. Uh, but also according to the availability of all the adults surrounding, so the partners or other carers that could support. So it takes a constellation of small or big efforts to make things happen, which I find very interesting. Casey, uh, if I go to you, um, um, again, I will ask you to, to briefly describe yourself. Um, the, uh, what was striking for me is I've heard of the PIPA initiative already uh, years ago when it all started. And I remember the success of the campaign that was led uh, and the um, you know the resonance or the 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 success of reaching out a lot of practitioners from the performing arts to say this is a blind spot uh, we should be working on this all together uh, could you could you tell us a little bit more about the the premises of of the PIPA campaign yeah sure um uh, my name is Cassie Rain I am. Uh, a white female in my 40s. I've got long brown hair and a ponytail and I'm wearing a brown jumper with a black polo neck. Um, I'm sitting in my kitchen, a picture of London behind me. Um, it's really, it's really lovely to be here because, you know, and, and, and to hear, to, to be part of this conversation because when we founded Parents and Carers and Performing Arts six years ago, there was no dialogue. There was, you know, there, there was no conversation. Um, so I am an actor, and my my business partner Anna and the other co-founder, is a theatre director. And we met when my first daughter was eight months old. Uh, yes, eight months old, and I took her to a rehearsal that Anna's theatre company was. Um, was holding where children were allowed in the room and this was something that was you know was never heard of I haven't worked since I declared that I was pregnant when I was five months pregnant so I hadn't worked for this whole kind of stretch of time and suddenly there was this open door where I could take my child um, and it was alternately exciting and frustrating and she cried and but I was in the room I felt part of it and I was part of lots of other artists doing this and as I went through that kind of early stage with my daughter I just really struggled I really struggled I didn't have any support I didn't I don't have family around me I couldn't afford childcare, and I was rocking up at kind of auditions I couldn't tour and there was no support and I just you know I'd, I'd been brought up to kind of think I was equal in the world. And then and then here I was kind of confined to my kitchen with this kid. And, and I spoke to Anna about it. I was like, this can't, it can't just be us. It can't just be me. And, and I'm, you know, I'm relatively privileged. And so we started asking around, we spoke to people, we went to Equity, the Actors Union in England. And we said, look, we think this is a problem. We think this is a problem for lots of people. We're not sure if this is a thing, but it, it seems to be a thing for us. And they said, all right, here's 2,000 pounds. Why don't you have an event and find out? So the Young Vic Theatre gave us their space to um, host an event. We didn't even know if anybody would turn up. 
because it was invisible. No one spoke about it. Well, we knew it could have just been us in the room. And we had 400 people show up and over 70 babies. And it wasn't just actors. It wasn't just musicians or dancers or stage management. It was executives. It was casting directors, you know, bookers, everything. A whole room full of people kind of going, we can't work. And so after that, we realized that this was a thing and that we needed to do something. We also realized that because parenting and caring is kind of seen as soft, there was no data, there was no evidence. This was a whole kind of group of people. No one really was interested in, no one knew anything about, and it was invisible. So we set about um, conducting research. We got funding from the Arts Council of England. We worked with 14 organizations and we conducted a huge survey and, and the, the challenge for people was, was, was epic. And it was, it was very obvious to everybody. Then we had a, we had a, a kind of case for support. We, and we worked with organizations, 14 of them initially, to see what they could do, see what we could come up with in response to the findings of this, of this survey. Because we work antisocial hours, we go on tour, the show is in the evening, you know, and, and there was just this kind of prevailing, it's just the way that it is, nothing can be done. And we went, hang on, there's got to be some, like inclusion and diversity is a, is a massive, there's a massive focus in the performing arts. And so we worked with these organizations and at the end of it, they came up with a best practice charter, we kind of facilitated that process. And it's a set of 10 guiding principles to help organizations work towards achieving best practice. We look at things like recruitment, we look at working practices, we look at additional resources, childcare, um, communication, and policies. And around this, we have created a program. So it's a kind of facilitated program that's kind of monitored and evaluated at every step of the way so organizations can see their progress. We now have over 70 partners. We have 56 organizations taking part in the best practice charter program. And in theater, the, the landscape has completely changed. You know, we have on-stage job shares, backstage job shares, job shares at every level of organizations, flexibility, and people are talking about it. You know, so it's a completely different landscape to when we set up six years ago. That's beautiful. That's a fantastic example of, uh, you know, it, a big push and, and, and starting the conversation indeed. Um, and it's fascinating that it is both, I mean, people in the industry, so freelance workers, but not only artists, like really a lot of different profiles uh, join forces to address the issue and organization responded. Uh, because this is, you know, the... the yeah you know, a wild guess in a way, but it's nice to see that uh, today you reach out to 70 organization that in a way made commitments and had um, um, a review of their processes and adapted to, you know, reality, just that. Um, maybe I just back, go back to you, Louise, because in these process and these conversations, um, you also had to, in a way, um, have these conversation with uh, venues and festivals and residency centers in order for your artists to you know access opportunities and you being you know in between uh, uh you know the arts uh, uh, the, the artist and you know the gatekeepers as we call them um you also had to somehow build the case find the arguments try to convince or to explain i uh, want you just share with us a little bit about this experience. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I will begin with a more pessimistic quote and trying to go more optimistic <laughs> on the side. Um, recently, uh, also uh, re in resonance with what Emeka said about the fathers, I want to share a, a little. Uh, uh, this comment we add is about uh, an artist who is a father, who is uh, already a father, is going to be a father again, 
Uh, he has multiple shows of his company presented in uh, one big festival in France and is going to be a father during this period. So we warned the organizers that, that he couldn't, he couldn't uh, go like five months before the event. And uh, I read a, a small quote uh, of the answer of the organizer. Uh, I consider it a drift. I fully understand that artists have a private life and that in this life there is room to be mom and or dad. There is nothing to say otherwise. On the other end, I do not conceive that these two realities are opposed to each, to each other, that private life becomes an obstacle to professional lives and leads to questioning commitments made. Our entire profession is based on respect for certain fundamental values, including this one. <laughs> but this was the answer we received after we won this organizer five months ago, uh, before the event that it was not beca possible because the father wanted to be there for the birth of his child. <laughs> so this is like the 2023 now. Uh, we received it like a few months ago, but I want to share more optimistic <laughs> part. Also, that uh, for example, on the on the show was I was backing up for many years, which is the show uh, called Martin Film with seven women on stage uh, from all over Europe. We decided uh, quite quickly that we wanted to uh, note on the very first draft we sent to organizer that. We are coming with families. We it was it was depending on the time, but it was written. Uh, we are coming with four to six babies, <laughs> so it was like, so you you have to find accommodation and you have to not we we want we ask not to be in hostels, but in BNBs, for example, like accommodation that are also close to the place where we we were performing. Uh, um. Uh, there were mainly there was no problem about that. Uh, the, um, the the nice part was that the difficult one that uh, is that uh, it uh, it never happens that one organizer asks before. It's like we always have to ask. <laughs> so it's uh, from the recommendation part we will go further. I think it's uh, something really important to us because it's always us, like or the the team or the manager uh, I represent, that we always have to ask, <laughs> and we have to do this pedagogical uh, matter. So, from what uh, Casey uh, uh, explained, it's also very important this matter of charter, etc., because it's also like a way of raising awareness, and it's not it's not relying uh, only on. Uh, people who are concerned, like it's a public affair. <laughs> so finally, um, mainly when we have this uh, this uh, situation, now it's written and it's it's written in the contract that we are coming with children. We need this kind of um, accommodation. We need the carers to be taken in charge uh, for uh, um, accommodation and food. Uh, the um, the problem we have at the moment is that we it's it's not taken in charge that we uh, the the travel sorry are not taken in charge so this is um, uh, for the moment it, it relies only on companies or or the persons themselves so when you speak about uh, crossing borders it goes fast yeah i can imagine i can imagine definitely um, it is interesting, though, that, um, you know, in a way, the artistic collective, uh, with your support, came with a plan, in a way, came with a series of, you know, bullet points in the technical writer saying, this is how it's going to happen. And this is, in a way, not negotiable. I mean, we'll not leave our kids behind just to please you and to, you know, tick the box coming to your festival and, you know, developing or uh, proposing the performance. So it is interesting that you you took the lead, I think. Um, and I can feel that um, uh, the idea of um, 
is this is a conversation that you are starting. Uh, um, I think you are right in saying that it cannot always be an individual conversation. And at some point to have guidance um, uh, made public that everybody can refer to just in case of, you know, wandering or discovering um, and to have a charter or to have, uh, you know, websites um, um, proposing some sort of points that everybody should agree upon, etc., is valuable in terms of exchanging uh, good practice and information. Um, when it comes to um, um, welcoming artists, um, Emeka, I know that you, I mean, you, you run a space uh, in Lagos. Um, I don't know if you were, um, because you have this second hat of being also a host and being able to potentially welcome artists. Um, do you have some sort of policies or guidelines uh, or do you have some sort of mindset around welcoming artists with their families? The thing is that like, uh, reality is that, you know, having residencies with kids could be very challenging. That's why my, from my experience, I just find being flexible on both sides because you could plan everything and suddenly something goes wrong and you have to be in that situation to be able to react and still make the thing work. So for us, it's important to just have um, kind of certain guidelines where we all work towards or see and say, okay, because the, the average parent that comes to a new space will want a space that is safe, we want a space that is, um, depending on the, on the age of the child. We also want, want a space where the person will have access to healthcare if there's an emergency. They want to have a space also where um, maybe mobility also, if they want to go from one place to the other. For example, if most people come with a kid, so probably if you have maybe a bicycle, that has a child carrier or whatever. So the person is more flexible, the person can go on, on short trips. So basic things like that, you just have to kind of take care of. And then I think our, our own advantage is that we kind of almost organized as a community where, you know, like, for example, when it comes to educational activities for the kid, nearby we have like a, a private school that, one can easily integrate any kid in the private school. It's near, the parents can also always go and, and kind of check on the kid whenever the person wants. So it's really a bit like a, a close knitted community. Um, but basically it's just like, what well, everyone needs to be flexible because um, you can't plan everything. You know, you can plan and then suddenly the kid becomes sick, what, what do you do? You know, like you find you have to really react and make sure that it works. And then I find one important thing is also, it is a big financial burden, even on the artist, because most times you find that an artist want to want to come with his or her kid, but you find that once a kid is around two years, the kid already pays the full cost of a ticket. So you find, you know, even have, you know, traveling with a kid as an artist, you have to almost make provision for almost an adult as if the kid is an adult when it comes to moving from one place to the other. It is interesting because uh, what you describe is also, it not only takes a conversation as we were saying, but it also takes a, a community. Uh, and it's a community project almost to be able to welcome parents in your venue, residency space, festival, et cetera, in the sense that you have to put into place way more than just a space or way more than just, you know, this is the emergency number in case you need it, but it takes much more effort than that. Um, I like very much that you insist on the, on the flexibility aspect and also that you... Uh, um, you know, highlight the 
healthcare, but I would say almost the well-being of parents because of the worry involved. Uh, and this is something that we hear also quite often, uh, young parents being worried to just leave their kid even next room when they are rehearsing or practicing or, you know, performing. So it takes way more than just um, 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 a couple of elements uh, to make sure that everything goes according to plan. Um, and then um, uh, what also is interesting is that you bring the money issue in the conversation. Um, when we talk about um, parenting in the arts, quite often, especially at um, when working internationally, we hear testimonies or comments saying, I don't have the financial capacity to be able to offer this, not only because of the airfare and the extra, you know, tickets we need to support to be able to welcome not only the artist, but also their families, but also because of this infrastructure almost, or this, uh, you know, um, this, uh, con these conditions that you have to put together to be able to, you know, welcome uh, uh, parents in, a, you know, in good conditions. So the money is something that we hear quite often. Uh, when monitoring uh, the open calls, uh, around 700 or 800 calls that we publish every year on our website, open calls for residencies, open calls for, you know, participating in festival programs, open calls for grants um, from very diverse, uh, you know, projects or funding bodies. We don't see very often, even I would say we never see, you know, in the criteria or the conditions of uh, that a special attention would be put on to parents, uh, artists and their families uh, for, you know, obvious financial conditions. Um, however, we also see quite uh, a lot of examples year after year of especially residency programs, showcasing that they welcome families or they even have a special, you know, uh, title or segment of activity dedicated to um, uh, artist parent. Um, so we see that the or the needle is moving or the conversation is, uh, is changing or growing. Uh, the level of awareness is also growing. Um, but I was wondering if, apart from the money issue, you see other elements that prevent uh, artists and cultural professionals to access international opportunities? Well, the thing is, like, um, I think it might depend on different regions. Because typically, if um, most artists in the in the global north will be a bit skeptical of coming especially when they're if they are parents you know taking up a residency in africa you know with with the, with, the, with their kid i think they'll be i think my experience it's a bit they will be a bit skeptical in doing that because you know obviously but i think it's something cultural if you're not used to or if you think that where you where where you're about to go is a bit culturally you know too diverse or whatever you might be skeptical to kind of take that plunge um yeah but apart from that i find um it actually depends on the offer being made if from because i'm being practical if i'm being most artists get offers of of a residency that in the space is okay, the money to, you know, buy their flight tickets and live on during that residency, if they can afford it, I think, or if they, if they can, if they think it's okay for them, I think they will take it up because I, I think majority of the art, majority of artists want that experience of the, of the other space, you know, to experiment, to explore and, you know, uh, kind of develop their work further. But I find personally, um, no matter how idealistic you are, I think most artists will think about the practical end of how practical is it 
can I afford it? Is it? Am I having enough funding that will warrant me moving from one space to the other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, practical practicalities do matter. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, uh, Casey, <laughs> nodding. Uh, um, in terms of, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, what would prevent, um, uh, you know, uh, artist parents or cultural professionals, uh, parents to access foreign opportunities or international opportunities? I think it's, I mean, there's lots of, so much of this, this conversation, you know, you, you said there's, there's not one solution fits all. There's a, it's, it's a multifaceted challenge and it requires a kind of a multifaceted approach. Um, and there's several things I wanted to um, pick up on. So the things that Louise, Michelle, that you're talking about, Emeka, that you're talking about, we, we have names for all of these things that we promote to our partners. And these are all things that signal invitation and belonging and welcome so whether your venue is in Africa whether it's in Scotland whether it's in Thailand you know if you have the right communication and the right signs and the right messaging that that person knows that they will be welcome and safe in your company with their children then they will come to your venues so ideally a venue or a festival producer will reach out, you know, so so you, they take the onus off the individual because when the individual has to come forward and say, I'm a parent and carer or carer, what, how can you support me? Then already they feel like they're slightly asking for something that other people aren't getting. Whereas actually, if the responsibility is the employer to say, or, or the festival to say, what do you need? What do you need in order to come and do your work at our festival? And how can we support that? So we've just published, which I'll share in a minute, um, because it's freely available, an access rider. So we see caring responsibilities like any other access need. You know, so on the form, it's you don't need to specify what your situation is, but simply what you need in order to be able to come. And that's a really helpful document for organizations to kind of know what what what's what's what could be asked of them and what could be expected. The second thing, uh, Emika, what I loved about what you say, we call that a welcome pack. So a family friendly welcome pack. And it's basically something that all HIPAA organizations have, and it covers what the venue facilities are. So is there a fridge for breast milk? Is there a breastfeeding room? Do they provide childcare? Is there a list of local childcare providers? Um, what are the travel arrangements? How do they get there? Is it family friendly? Can you store a buggy there? What are the family, friend what are the family friendly accommodation options? Um, and what local facilities? You know, Emika, you talked about medical facilities and a parent needs to know you know what what those facilities are and that will give them confidence to come um and we have two things i just wanted to mention one is we call it a pippa champion so it's somebody within the organization who is like a kind of sign poster so in the family friendly welcome pack organizations can say if you experience a caring related problem this is your person who will support you and signpost you where you need to be and that, that dedicated person is then available for any emergencies or any, or any questions. And the second is what we call a pipa pot. So people are always going to continue having care-related emergencies. And the extent to which that is going to impact your production or your organization depends on what provision you already have in place. Otherwise, what we see is organizations ending up with kind of emergencies all over the place. They have to mitigate anyway. So our partner organizations, not all of them, and it's, it's not widely publicized, but we've introduced this thing called a pipper pot, which is a ring fenced budget line that organizations have in case of a caring related need or emergency. 
you know, whether that's one example was a father who was rehearsing a play. He was booked for a long time. He was rehearsing a play. His wife was due to give birth at the beginning of rehearsals. And he needed that time off at the beginning of rehearsals, which they gave him. And financially, they had the pippa pot. So they were able to kind of get a replacement to, for that period of time. So they were prepared for that scenario. They got the act they wanted and the show went on. So what we advocate for is that organizations are prepared and resourced adequately at the sort of planning stages so that when people do present with caring responsibilities, they're, they're able to support. Yeah, that's yeah. the variety of... No, no, but that's no. very informative in, also in terms of tools that you create to answer the needs. And I guess, Louise Michel, you you want also to, <laughs> to Yeah, yeah. To I, I acknowledge totally what, what uh, Casey said. And I just want to share also that we are in an um, employer syndicate in France, in a circus employer syndicate. And we are uh, uh, advocating at the moment for a financial support when you start again after giving birth. Because also this is a period where you are not, uh, you don't compulsory want to be back on stage right uh, right after your uh, your uh, your time, your due time. But you would like to be back in the collective and to know what's going on, what are the next creation, etc. But of, uh, most of the time, the company cannot afford that. So we are uh, advocating for a financial support for this. Uh, per, uh, for so that the person could be on tour without performing, she's back. She 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 or he <laughs> uh, back uh, uh, on tour and see the all co uh, the collective can be back on rehearsal, not uh, performing but on rehearsal, and recover physically. I was uh, as I was talking before, and get in touch for future creations, etc. And so finding uh, being back on stage with no brutal transition. So also about money possibilities. <laughs> but uh, also, I mean, because you are working a lot in collaboration with other collectives, but also you are part of these of uh, advocating within several, you know, uh, organization or unions or syndicates or federations. I mean, you are really part of the of the you know industry conversation around parenting. Do you have also other recommendations or or you know the ideas that you put forward, you know, and and try to raise awareness or or design specific tools? Um, in France? Um, I think we have already named many, <laughs> of, especially when the case talked about like the charter, the bullet list, uh, the fact that the organizer takes the responsibility, the uh, money for travels, accommodations and food, uh, the what I was talking about, the recovery, physical recovery period, um, um, also, it's like a more uh, global thing about this discussion inside teams, like it requires also that you are a bit trained to organize this. You cannot uh, improvise this also that it's, it's about, we are talking about this matter of parenting, care and mobility, but it's uh, a, global, um, a global issue that uh, we are not uh, so good at this in uh, cultural uh, organizations uh, having a social uh, discussions what are their needs what are the rules how we can adapt and we can so this is like a more global one and uh, also like um, a more global um, recommendation would be not to focus on mothers and women to do this job like as i said also taking consideration the partners and it will help everybody <laughs> like more uh, more of that and yeah like the maybe la last thing i would say before uh, the question and answer is also uh, trying to adjust the rhythm to the most uh, vulnerable profile like solo parents so it will uh, benefit to all the others 
because um, for example, like we, we have this example, like solo parents, and we are trying to to adjust that. Um, we know that it it is really better for the others also. And this is something I saw in the in the points of entry podcast you were mentioning at the beginning. It was also interesting. Like also this issue could uh, could help us for many other issues that are uh, here in the cultural field that we don't address. Yeah, no, it is very interesting, and and this goes back to the access rider that you were talking about, Casey. Of you know, how do you put into place mechanisms that can actually cater for very different needs, not only the needs of the parents, but of disabled artists and many other, you know, uh, uh, people in our in our sector that could actually benefit for accompaniment measures or for support uh, to actually deliver the best um, and uh, be able to thrive uh, in their work. Um, I'm going to open the floor uh, to uh, the participants and attendees of today. Um, I'm not sure you use the, the chat uh, to post uh, questions or comments or links, but uh, you can definitely um, um, use your digital hand and make sure that uh, we can see you if you want to take the floor. Uh, and contribute with, um, you know, lived experience, examples that you you encountered in the in your professional trajectory, but also resources or ideas. We are very keen to collect ideas and and recommendations. Um, um, before uh, giving the the floor to to participants, um, I just have a question around um, this international dimension. Uh, that we focus on today and the advocacy part. I mean, we heard from the three of you that you have um, uh, boiled down many arguments uh, uh, and translated that into practical tools, be it, you know, contracts, being um, technical writers or access writers, being a charter, etc. What do you think we should be advocating uh, um, um, towards, you know, arts councils, ministries of cultures, uh, EU institutions. What are the elements you uh, we could shape collectively to actually raise the awareness even further and propose very practical measures? For me, I think. Um... I think you know when it, when one is dealing with institutions, I think it should be we should have programs that are that are actually um, more tailored to kind of um, encourage parents or artists that are parents to apply for these residencies, because I think that will really help in changing the attitude of both art practitioners and also facilitators because the the thing is that like being an artist and parenting and be, being wanting or having this urge to to be mobile to go to residencies does not diminish your professionalism or the quality of the work you do as an artist so if um, we can i know there are already you know institutions that you know um, precisely invite artists with families and with kids to apply for residencies. But I think it's still um, very um, the minority at the moment. I think there should be an advocacy to increase such possibilities um, for artists with, with, with um, families and or with kids. Mm -hmm. uh, Louise, um... Um, do you have some some suggestions on your on your side? Um, yeah, but uh, advocating globally, <laughs> uh, which which uh, do you mean? Yeah, which which point we would like to advocate especially, um, like really really raising awareness and like. Um, money support from organizers okay so the host and more than the politicians mm -hmm. <laughs> and casey um 
My uh, my wish list is long, uh, but I'll keep it brief. I was just so first of all, just to respond to the question about um, funding. Certainly in the UK, there's it's not very clear about what you can and can't apply for in terms of access. Well, it, it is clear actually. The access costs on an arts council application, for example, you cannot include uh, care related childcare related expenses. Um, that's something that we've been advocating for for a, for a long time. But I do know that the way lots of lots of companies do it is building it into their practice. It's so into the kind of the body of the application. Um, and I know you know lots of organisations have got funding for a kind of for fresh for child care for assistance personally we would like to see it as part of the um as, as part of the access uh, entitlement that is offered from funders um, and the other thing i would say from organizations is when they have funding deadlines please don't put them in the holidays please don't put them in the in the child care holidays the amount of you know ceos of 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 big organizations who have these huge deadlines in the middle of the, the holidays uh, and it makes it really challenging um i think on a political level uh, accessible affordable flexible child care is an absolute necessity from every government and the uk is, is really far behind on that but we we are working towards that shared parental leave um is another because this isn't a women's issue, this is a collective issue, and we have to enable, empower men to take up their kind of, it, it's, it's their equality, equal status at work and at home, for men and women and same-sex partners. Um, so I would say shared parental leave and childcare. They're my two political, policy asks <laughs> and political let's let's be honest and political um, thank you for these recommendation it is also interesting that um, many of these points are related to mindset it feels i mean in terms of uh, equality as you said but also when emeka was was talking about the uh, in a way that the, we have to fight this feeling of lack of legitimacy or lack of credibility as soon as you are parent like suddenly you start from scratch because you had a kid so you have you know gaps in your resume or you have you know all these things that we have to to fight and especially for artists um like you don't you shouldn't be um, uh, feeling that you start from scratch um i can see that we have um, a couple of um of questions in the chat um and i'm probably gonna ask first or, or read um um Rebecca Nord uh, questions. Are you, uh, for example, in the UK or France applying for funding to help with these issues already when you apply for funding to create a performance? So, I mean, Casey, you answered a little bit in relation of these costs as such not being eligible. Uh, what about in France, with Louise Michel? It is not. Uh, I, I... I don't know all, of course, but uh, I, I don't see it mentioned anywhere. So, for example, for a show that uh, we are uh, we are producing at the moment, and uh, the the artist is going to give birth at the end of this month, we want to to include this in the budget. But I think we will do the same way as uh, Cassie said that we will put inside the application into the corporate the application and and if we are asked in the details we will explain more that we need this and this and why did we put this line of budget but yeah no at the moment uh, not as such <laughs> um i don't uh, I, I see a, a message from eva in the chat i'm a visual artist and performer and for me one of the most important question is how open calls sometimes demand to be present for several weeks even months which seems difficult to stand up to as a parent most often i don't even apply 
it would be great if in open calls the times given would be again more flexible and depend on the time needed by the artist instead of given in advance could this idea be included in in an access rider or other chart in the future I think this is a valid point in terms of flexibility, but uh, I'm not here to judge. So uh, if you have comments, uh, the three of you. Is this, um, is this um, to do with an open pool? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really sure I understand the question. Is it that, is it that the date is kind of set so far in advance or? It is like you apply to, or you see a call for residency in Nicaragua, and it, it is three months, you know, and uh, three months seems like a lot for parents to be away, even with their kids, you know, even if the, all the conditions are wonderful. So the idea of the lack of flexibility in these open calls for uh, projects or for residencies, etc. if I understood uh, the question, but don't hesitate ever to to post again if I if I um, if I didn't. Excuse me, do you hear me? Yes. Um, so it uh, it, it meant uh, mostly uh, the duration of the residencies mm -hmm. is often given in the open call, mm -hmm. but uh, it's uh, for me for example it's impossible to be present uh, for like three months uh, at a time, and uh, I don't even think that for example for certain projects it is uh, it should be obligatory to be there for such a long time if the project in itself could be realized in a shorter time. But at the same time, there are residencies which uh, don't give you the uh, the flexibility like we you've mentioned before, and I think it's a key. Uh, and th that's why I'm asking if this could be uh, probably incorporated into another charter or something that you are preparing probably, uh, maybe for France even, that would be great. <laughs> Um, so it was just uh, something to mention. It's rather a comment than a question. It's true, uh, but I think it's to to be considered also on the long term. Thank I you. I just want to jump in quickly. Hello, everyone. It's Katie Carriage Watts from On the Move. Um, we I when the podcast episode that points of entry did with um, On the Move um, with Hedy Judah, we talked actually about this in the podcast and. Um, <clears throat> she, we specifically talked about this idea of duration and that one specific need in terms of mobility is the need to be flexible and being like, well, I, I can't be on site for three months. And so I maybe need two weeks on and two weeks off or whatever the combination that works for you basically. Um, and I think that this is also an interesting point that maybe this particular issue as it relates to mobility combines with some other stuff that on the move works on and advocates for which is things like green mobility so even if you're not a parent like maybe it's also interesting for you to, to because you have other needs that are not nothing to do with parenting but it could be this idea of hybridity and so it's really focusing on you know maybe it's going to be part virtual and part on site and I think it's it's just this whole what we're talking about really is this mindset sh mindset shift from you know the, the institution as really being of service to the artists instead of being some like the artist as something in, instead of kind of the other way around, which I think is unfortunately how a lot of this space functions. And so that is a really long term generational mind shift, I mindset shift, I think. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these spaces like they just don't. It, we're still at the level, I think, of trying to get enough people to listen to it and be like, oh, we need to change how we're doing things. And maybe this is one of those spaces, basically. Thank you for this. And, and thank you also, Eva, for, for uh, bringing this um, uh, particular aspect on. Um, I think, indeed, uh, I mean, both the uh, deadlines during holidays, the flexibility in terms of calendar agenda, the lengths of projects and residencies are 
uh, very interesting points um, and definitely for open calls, but also for founders supporting mobility trips, basically giving travel grants, etc. Um, um, working around or taking these aspects on board could be an interesting uh, recommendation. Um, I'm just checking now if there are other uh, points that were shared in the chat. Um, I could see if there is, please let me know or take the floor. You see, it's quite a, uh, open. I see, uh, Elon, I'm wondering what your experience is in how artists manage to combine their roles as artists and as a parent during residencies. I used to apply to residencies to take a step back from my daily conditions and surroundings. Now, as a parent, I don't want to be away from my family, but still want to focus on artistic work. Uh, this situation puts me in a split. Um, do you have any reaction up to this? Emeka? I think, I think um, it's I think it's a natural reaction for every parent because um, definitely you want, as I said before, you know, an environment that will be safe for you and the kids or the kids. So I think um, if you, I think it's if you if you're if you're interested in really going for a residency, and you apply and you get accepted, I think the next step is to start a conversation with the facilitator. I think it's the job then of the facilitator to kind of assure you or reassure you, depending on your needs, that at least to an extent, those needs will be met. And I think if you get those assurances, I think that will give you more confidence to go ahead. But I think this um, does the conversation will determine actually how you feel or you know how to trust the facilitator. Mm -hmm. You know, it is interesting and important because you touch upon also the psychology or the, you know, the, the again, the, the notion of care and well-being. So what are the conditions you propose to reassure um, uh, parents? But I understand also the, uh, uh, the comment on being, I mean, willing or wanting to focus on... Um, an artistic practice, so to be kind of isolated and away from anything that could, you know, uh, disturb the the very making of an artwork, and at the same time being very keen to just spend time with your family and uh, and to navigate these paradox that is uh, very difficult to to navigate, probably. So I hear you. <laughs> Um, do we have other other comments? Um, so um, I don't see questions. Um, Anais, Anais Gabo is asking uh, um, if we know of other examples of good practices in other sectors. Um, so I don't know if during the I'm going back to, to the speakers, if um, um, in your process of designing tools, et cetera, you went to other fields like sports, uh, academic world, uh, you know, businesses to actually compare, contrast, or be inspired by what was existing in other fields and try to adapt it or import it in, in our cultural field. Uh, Louise, you wanted to react on this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, at the beginning, I was talking about the uh, Basinga, Basinga company. And she is the one who is leading the conversation at the moment in the circus in France. And uh, so she, um, she's, a, she's a tight warrior artist, very high, uh, uh, higher distance. <laughs> and she, so she is also like a high level uh, sport uh, athlete. So she went to the to search uh, in the sports field, 
And there is, uh, uh, like in France, there is a national center for everything, but the national center for for uh, high level athletes. And they are, they are taken in charge, like really globally, like food uh, recovery after, preg- after giving birth during the pregnancy, mental support, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was like um, um, kind of uh, uh, yeah, raising awareness, awareness for her that we are at this, uh, at this level and we don't have almost anything of this. So this is also a place where uh, I think we will have to, to go a bit deeper and to have exchanges because, for example, for circus artists, there, there is a high intensity of uh, physical um, things and this is a maybe we we are going to dip into to dig into this uh, field Mm. that's interesting how the athletes have access to very special conditions uh and athletes from the arts don't uh yet but let's put it this way (laughs) Uh, the, the ballet so the big ballet companies have uh have physiotherapists and have rehabilitation kind of on site um, and sports science you know like you say has has made huge progress and one of the things that we've just been looking at in a report that's coming out shortly is about dancers and, and what you were saying Louise Michel about the, the physical recovery of dancers so there's there's a lot of study about the impact of pregnancy on the body and there's a lot of study of, of kind of ballet dancers, but there's, and a lot of sports sites, but there's nothing where these two kind of come together. And what you see there is a, is a huge risk of injury and a, and a sort of self, a self-defined back to work plan that, that, that isn't founded in, in science. The science is there, but it's not accessible. Um, and maybe, and, and there is a need for more research specifically around those disciplines in the same way that there has been you know, in sports. No, it is very interesting also uh, how, um, I guess, everybody tries to find solution, as you said, sometimes in an emergency response or trusting individuals to come with a plan, uh, which is not a given. I mean, you know, to come with a full plan and to have the distance and uh, knowledge and everything to be able to propose something coherent, consistent and etc. So, I, I, I hear also the growing uh, part of the, of each organization uh, would be also to be able to share examples of practices. So as part of us EU networks, and I'm thinking all these um, uh, EU networks from ITM for performing arts or Circus Strata for Circus and Street Arts, um, uh, European Theatre Convention for Theatre, so how these sectorial networks also could include these theme as a working theme and a conversation among organizers and stakeholders in their respective field um, and make sure in a way everybody can raise awareness uh, of, of the conditions. Um, it feels also uh, because you bring some um, national examples that to be able to access the uh, information around the legal aspect of it would also be helpful. I know in France, the National Center for Theatre, uh, Street Art and Circus have published a, a first guide on the on the matter, listing all the legal issues, all the legal help you could find the you know um, uh, from different you know public funding bodies or private bodies being able to support parenting, um, and I guess this is also something that is useful to access you know uh, work or legal uh, you know legal frameworks and. Uh, employers regulations and etc i mean to have this information accessible and i guess uh, i mean we are here in, in countries where um this might be easy but um, i have in mind many countries that maybe don't have the same uh, you know access to information um i'm just gonna maybe conclude now because i see it's almost time 
I see also that there are comments, very interesting comments in the chat with links shared, examples shared. So we will make sure that after this uh, webinar, we will publish um, a resource, uh, an info um, um, page where we will share the links uh, exchange, not only the ones exchanged today, but the one uh, we collected already in the past of different initiatives uh, around this um, particular topic. Um, and we will make sure that this uh, webinar is, um, is available online. Uh, it will appear, of course, at our partner, Horround TV, um, but it will also be uh, available from On The Move website and On The Move uh, YouTube channel. Um, so at least you can um, forward it, share it. I saw that one of the suggestions was to share it with Arts Council's uh, officers and funding bodies, which is a great, um, <laughs> a great uh, uh, proposal. Um, but at least uh, this uh, video or this recording can, can be um, uh, circulated um, uh, further. Uh, the last uh, maybe point I would like to, to share with you is that in a couple of months, um, because we are uh, continuing to work on this topic, we aim at publishing a, a very short report on parenting, care, and cultural mobility. So try to summarize the many testimonies we uh, collected, but also today's conversation and further research, desk research we will be doing in the coming weeks. So before the summer, you will have um, like a short publication and hopefully it will, you know, um, serve uh, in whatever context to continue the conversation with your um, local, national authorities, EU colleagues, uh, international uh, arts organizations, etc. Um, I'm going to take the time to thank each of the three panelists. Thank you very much, Louise Michel, uh, Cassie, and Emeka, for contributing so brilliantly to the conversation, sharing your personal experience, but also the, the you know, the achievements. Um, that you you had across the you know in the last years, uh, also to share the you know the toolkits you had the, the bag of tricks you you created uh, along the along the year, but also to share the philosophy, the values or principles that sh we should be you know reflecting upon and uh, continue to to work on. Uh, so thank you to my colleagues. Uh, Marie Le Sourd, uh, Cathy Watts, uh, Jess Partridge, um, and to our live captioner uh, today, who was typing like crazy everything we said. Um, so I want to thank you. In the chat, you will find both a link towards a quick, very quick uh, evaluation form that we would, you know, love you to, to fill in. It's just five or six questions. So it's very easy and very quick, but it will help us and inform us for the next webinars. And of course, I can only encourage you to register uh, to subscribe to the on, on the Move newsletters, especially if you're interested in receiving open calls for residencies, for festivals, etc., and to to see the many, many, many uh, you know information and resources we we circulate around. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you.